It's the 27th of March 1995. Thousands of people crammed inside the Shrine Auditorium in LA, and the millions watching at home see a smiley, scarf-clad man bounce up onto the stage after hearing his name called for the Oscar for the Best Original Score. He thanks the fluffiest actor in show business as the presenters move away, and he says that he wrote a speech but it's so boring he's not going to bother with it. As he rattles off a list of family, friends, directors and producers he'd like to thank, his hands are running through his hair and his eyes can't fix on the spot in the hall. Eventually he declares writing a score is so much easier than this, thank you so much, just please let me go, takes his award and leaves the stage as quickly as he arrives. The name called just a few moments before was Hans Zimmer. Not yet legendary the world over, but certainly not unfamiliar in the remote La La Land he finds himself. This is his story. Born in Frankfurt in West Germany in 1957, and raised in a nearby Königstein Falkenstein, he was certainly cut from a different kind of cloth from most of the big time composers that came before him. He hated his two weeks of piano lessons, and he was thrown out a total of eight different schools in his early years. Almost entirely self-taught, he joined bands and played music, often in very unconventional ways. Family piano would often end up being modified thanks to Hans, something which his engineer father would look kindly upon, unlike his more musical mother. And when his father died during his childhood, that only drew him closer to music, essentially making it his best friend. Going back even further, his Jewish mother had managed to escape Germany to England in 1939, and she would return again with Hans during his teenage years. He started writing a bunch of jingles and tracks and producing various tracks for various bands, some of which he was even a part of. You might spot him playing keys in the back of Buggles' video Killed the Radio Star. And that wouldn't be his last cringeworthy tune in his back catalogue. In 1987 he wrote the theme tune for the game show Going for Gold. Cringeworthy as it may be though, he has a certain respect for that gig, stating that, after all, it paid his bills. It was around this time he got his first solo gig composing for film, Masteraki's Terminal Exposure. The following year he would score Rain Man, and over the next few years he would slowly build up a strong portfolio with reputable directors such as Ridley Scott and Bruce Beresford. Eventually, Disney approached him to score The Lion King, but there was one little problem. He was so passionate about going to South Africa to record part of the soundtrack for more authentic sound but that would actually put his life in danger. In 1992, he'd scored the film The Power of One, set in apartheid era South Africa. Not a very divisive plotline to us here 28 years after the regime's end, but in 1992, it was enough to earn him a police record for making subversive movies. The threat might have seemed like too much, but in response to this, the artist Lee Boehm agreed to go over to LA to record part of the soundtrack. And the result put the hands on that stage in LA a few months later, and into the history books. This was a man whose star was on the rise, yet he didn't fit the mould of nearly every other recipient of that award before him. He wasn't formally trained as a child, he didn't go to a prestigious college, and he probably wouldn't have even had a basic knowledge of conducting when he was starting out. Yet here he was. Hardly surprising then he was so nervous. It takes more than a speech folded up and tucked away in a suit pocket to be prepared for something like that. But his star didn't stop there. In the following decade, he wrote some of his most iconic scores. The Prince of Egypt, Gladiator, Multiple Pirates of the Caribbean, Pearl Harbor, and eventually, The Dark Knight. In fact, he managed to overturn a decision by the Academy to disqualify that score from consideration on account of having too many composers. His influence and notoriety had now been completely solidified and he was still writing at the top of the game. In 2010, he received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and he dedicated it to another success story in a harder climate, his good friend and publicist Ronnie Chaser, who'd been shot and killed the month before. And in November last year, he even had an asteroid named after him. <laughs> he has definitely reached astronomical heights. If there's one very clear takeaway from the life and career of Hans Zimmer, it's that formal training and academic success don't count for everything. Sometimes passion and encouragement can take you where you want to go, and maybe even further. It makes it a lot harder when you have to teach yourself everything, especially in such a competitive field as film scoring where building a name for yourself is everything. The people around you will be thinking in very different terms from you, but you can use that to your advantage 
and you can set yourself apart and beyond the game. It will be a tough struggle, but with the right support, a ton of passion and determination, and yes, just a bit of luck, it is possible. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and share it, and if you're new here, I would love to have you subscribe so you can hear even more of the incredible stories of music and film, just like Hans Zimmer's.